On behalf of the Adult Education Committee, we wanna welcome all of you to this morning's class. For those of you that were with us last Sunday, uh, Gerald, the interview with Gerald covered the paradigm shift, an artist story, and this morning, he will be sharing with us another body of work that he is working on creating, and that is called the Monumental Series, the Monument Series, I'm sorry. So our, our goal for these two sessions was really to raise awareness about the historical narrative related to racism and art and religion in some respects as, as it impacts our society in today's world. So we also wanted to encourage conversations about current responses to social unrest and racial inequality. And finally, we want to leave you with and encourage you to create thought provoking conversations within your circle of friends and associates and community to better understand how individuals can play a role in the societal paradigm and narrative shift as it relates to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So once again, thank you for joining us. As a reminder, if you have questions, please put them in the chat box. Those questions will be monitored and we will cover as many of them as possible this morning. Uh, there is, um, a video in addition to the recorded video of the interview I did with Gerald. And that goes for about 35 minutes. And then following that, we'll open it up for Q&A. So throughout his conversation today, be thinking about questions you might want to ask, um, your experience about these two sessions. If you'd like to share, that would be helpful. And any ideas you may have about uh, moving forward in a more equitable way as a church community and as a community at large. So Jim, if you would be kind enough to begin the, the re video recording. Good morning, my name is Cynthia Johnson and I am a member of the Fourth Presbyterian Adult Education Committee. We're delighted that you joined us again this week for the second session of the interview with Gerald Griffin. Last week, we learned about the Paradigm Shift series that Gerald created. And this week, we'll learn about his current works of art called Monumental Historical Narratives. The Monumental Narratives project transforms the way our country's history has been told. Gerald's work is looking to shift that way of thinking for generations to come. The pieces and this collection include Kamala Harris and Barack Obama. We'll see pieces and hear about Gerald's inspiration for creating this body of work. He'll also tell us about his perspective on creative social response to riots and destruction in our American cities. And he'll share his views on racial equality and recognition. You can put your questions in the chat box, and at the end of today's program, Gerald will answer as many of the questions as he can get to. Thank you very much, and before we get started with Gerald's presentation, let's take a look at the Monumental Series video. The Statue of Liberty is rooted in democracy and freedom, and for immigrants, she stands as a beacon of hope. The French creators were inspired by the American Revolution and the abolition of slavery, symbolized more specifically by a broken chain. Do you see it? Probably not. The link lies at her right foot and is hidden beneath her gown. It reappears in front of her left foot, but for African Americans, the broken chain was not the end of oppression, and Lady Liberty was hardly an inspiration for them in 1886. And I was like, wow, I had no idea the Statue of Liberty was tied to the history of African Americans. Just trying to create the 
illusion of these waves. Artist Gerald Griffin hopes to lift the veil on that broken chain by reimagining the symbolism of those links and telling a new story through sculpture, painting, and poetry. Life can be a challenge when you're black like me. Can't ever see the color on a cat like me. Griffin wasn't much of a student at Benito Juarez High School, but a friend noticed him doodling one day and encouraged him. A counselor switched him to art classes. I became the artist for the yearbook. I became the artist for the school newspaper. Um, I was in a photography club. It changed your life. Basketball it changed, it was totally changed my life, changed my perspective. It was just a hobby. It wasn't anything that I ever imagined I would be doing you know, as a livelihood. Sometimes it's confusing to be black like me. So many people always try to act like me. Now he produces works for everyone from Oprah to Hillary Clinton. Because if they hear me, maybe they'll see I'm the very person that they want to be. His prose inspires his visuals. These chains are broken, but unlike the Statue of Liberty, they're not hidden. More than 200 years after slaves were freed, Griffin says African Americans still have mental chains. You have African American families who continue today to eat the pig's ears, his guts, on and on, and say this is soul food. That's not soul food. That's the slave diet. You're not a slave, so you shouldn't be eating the slave diet. So the mental chains are still there. Despite being a notoriously racist film, Birth of a Nation was the first motion picture ever shown in the White House, viewed by Woodrow Wilson in 1915. This piece kind of speaks to the spirit of that. There are two shadows in the corner that are shadows cast of people standing and their clansmen. And the piece talks about that spirit, almost like a ghost that's in the house that continues to haunt this place that's symbolic of freedom and the heart of America. And there's actually, there's even an ominous figure standing in a doorway. Oh, right, um, I didn't see that. The yeah. lights are kind of dark. And yeah. it's this whole idea of how do we bring the light to this White House? How do we get that, that spirit, that lingering spirit out? It isn't so much about what white America does for black America. It's about what black America does for itself. But when we come together as a family, when we understand our history, when we understand uh, that no one can make you whole, you're already whole, mm -hmm. you just don't think you're whole, then when you realize that different paradigm, you have a paradigm shift, the chains break. And that sentiment is revealed in this painting. You have this young guy who's sitting on a white horse and it kind of speaks to this idea that our histories are intertwined. And this piece really was inspired by this, the story of Harry Tubman. We all know the iconic story of Harriet Tubman, who went to the South to free slaves and bring them back to the North. But what we don't look at is all the stops along the way that Harriet Tubman stopped, the barns that she hid people in, the underneath porches. Those were the barns and porches of white people who risked their lives and risked their families because they felt that slavery was wrong also. So we don't hear their story as part of the history and the narrative of African-American history when we should, and that helps to create this whole idea of us against them. Pools of paint come to life because Griffin can imagine it and create a new reality. He says it's the same for people. You can't achieve your dreams without imagining how life should be different. When I first walked through this whole exhibit, I just had a very powerful experience. Pastor Vicki Curtis says it's not just a message that connects with African Americans. This is called the Ascension. The Fourth Presbyterian Church on Michigan Avenue houses one of Griffin's paintings. And it's inspired by Oprah Winfrey's words, turn your wounds into wisdom. Learning about things like the Statue of Liberty or learning about things like, you know, all those individuals who helped Harriet Tubman. Learning that there's more to this story than what we've been taught. And as you learn, then you ascend spiritually, psychologically, physically, the world changes for you. Because if they hear me, maybe they will see I'm the very person that they want to be. Because before creation ever came to be, everything and anything was black like me. Good morning, Gerald. 
Good morning, it's, Cynthia. It's great seeing you again, and uh, we're looking forward to hearing about your latest pieces of work called our Monumental Narratives series. So given the racial and social unrest in the past year, am I correct in assuming that this project was an in inspiration based on what took place? Um, it was to a great extent. Um, it is an evolution of a series that I was doing before, The Paradigm Shift, and within that series, um, part of it was based on the monumental sculpture, the Statue of Liberty. And uh, in doing some research about the Statue of Liberty, I learned that um, it had a deep connection to the history of African Americans. I didn't learn that in school. You know, I, I learned the story everybody else learned about, you know, bring us your tired, your poor, and that the statue was about immigration and, and what it meant to be an American. <clears throat> But the history is that the statue was donated to the United States by the French after the Emancipation Proclamation to signify America's uh, willingness to live up to its promise of equality and liberty. And <clears throat> the original design for the uh, sculpture was going to be of an African woman with broken chains and shackles on her feet, kind of you know, commemorating this idea of emancipation. And after you know, much uh, discussion back and forth, negotiation back and forth, um, America didn't want that to be the lasting symbol of, you know, iconic symbol of what America was about. So they settled upon a, uh, this idea of a Greek uh, Persephone who is walking through the underworld to light the world, to light the liberty and bring light into the darkness. But the artist insisted upon the statue maintaining the shackle, broken shackle and chains on his feet. So if you were to look at the Statue of Liberty um, up close and look at her feet, you would see underneath her drapery that there's a chain and a shackle on her ankle. I never knew that story. I never knew that the Statue of Liberty had um, a significance to the history of African Americans. But learning that story gave me a different perspective. It shifted my paradigm. And um, if that was a widely known story, how would it change the opinions of white people about black people and the Statue of Liberty and how that is an iconic part of America and how they fit into it? How would that change black people's perspective growing up as kids, knowing that you're tied to this iconic symbol of America and that you're inclusive and part of that story and part of that fabric? So that's the importance of monuments and memorials. So when we had a summer of lockdown and people had cabin fever and there was racial unrest and there's all these different things going on, all this upheaval, and people were in the streets protesting and tearing down monuments, you know, uh, historical monuments. They may have had, you know, um, maybe they were Confederate monuments or they had, um, you know, romanticized monuments of, that were hurtful because they left out the histories and the whole story, like the story of the Statue of Liberty. And there was all this unrest, and people were like, oh my God, what are we gonna do now? You know, they're, you know, should we take these down? Should we, there's this, all of this unrest and pull things down. And I asked myself, what would be a creative social response to this, this situation? You know, how could we deal with this situation in a way that's constructive as opposed to destructive? And I thought that primarily the reaction of people was a visceral reaction because their story wasn't told. Instead, there was this romanticized story that was a lie in their eyes that was told. That was one-sided. Their story wasn't part of the narrative. So we're gonna tear down that narrative. But in that situation, then nobody's story is told. And my idea was to have a counter-narrative. Instead of tearing down, maybe we could build up monuments that told the other side of the story like the Statue of Liberty. You know, learning the full histories of those monuments and telling the full story in those monuments. And it would do two things. One, it would add to the historical narrative. It would include all people in that story and those histories and those memorials. Two, 
at a time when there was a lockdown and there was job losses, it would create jobs. It would create jobs for artists to create these monuments. It would create jobs for community members to help in building those monuments. It would create a coming together as opposed to a tearing apart. So this was my idea. And I created a proposal and I sent it to uh, the state senator and I sent it to the mayor's office and I sent it to all these different places to say, this is how I think this can be addressed. And my original idea was to create 10 uh, history-sized monuments, whether they were paintings or sculptures, huge pieces that could be in the public spaces, and that would add to the narrative. And that would be a way you couldn't have a crowd saying, I want to tear down this monument because my story isn't told. Well, now your story is here with that story, and there's no reason for the destruction because everybody's story is told, and we have a counterbalance and a counter narrative. And I started working on a few pieces that were maquettes or small size uh, samples because, you know, it's a lofty idea. Just writing it in a proposal, people would say, okay, but I can't even, you know, imagine what you're envisioning. So I started with uh, the first sculpture I did was called Kamala uh, MVP, which stands for Madam Vice President. Of course, this was before she was the Vice President, so <laughs> I was projecting it and hoping that that would be the outcome. Um, and it's a bust of Kamala Harris. And um, it would be a piece that, um, in my imagination, would be a full-size figure, not just a bust. But it would talk about this uh, contemporary, inclusive narrative within the historical uh, canon. And it would be a piece that would uh, like those Art Institute lions that has been there for hundreds of years. It would be a cast in a, uh, a time-tested material bronze, and it would be in a prominent place within the public square, and it would bring that inclusion and that other side of the story. Um, the second piece that I started working on, second maquette, is like a one-third life-size uh, full figure of Barack Obama. The piece is called Obama uh, FBP, uh, first black president. And I envision that being a two times life size piece that could be, again, in a public square, Obama having a strong significance to Chicago. But there are a lot of figures within this, uh, this series, like Dr. Daniel Hill Williams or Ida B. Wells or on and on, whose narratives and stories that we don't often hear. Um, you could have the sculpture of Thomas Jefferson in Jefferson Park along with a sculpture of uh, Sally Hemings and her kids, who was Thomas Jefferson's slave, and his children, who he kept in slavery. But it tells a more full story of Thomas Jefferson, where you're saying, well, this was a president, Declaration of Independence. Well, here's the other side of the story, where he was um, torn. You know, he had feelings for this woman. He had kids by this woman, but that's a hidden story. But that's part of the human fabric and part of the human story that we should be talking about and learning. And it takes away this, this desire to rip down the Thomas Jefferson sculpture because now you have these other narratives that are memorialized as well. Mm, very interesting. Gerald, what is your view on how art plays into the conversation about racial equity and recognition? Growing up and going to uh, different museums, uh, going to school as an art student, going to museums and walking around, I didn't see many artworks that were a reflection of me or my culture. And um, I almost felt like a visitor to another planet, you know, where everyone else is, is represented but, uh, but me. And I think that has a lasting effect on you as a person to feel excluded as opposed to included. And I think through art, um, we're able to have a different conversation if a different kind of art is presented. So an example would be how um, the Fourth Presbyterian Church uh, commissioned me to create a piece, Ascension, which uh, they wanted a piece that would talk about the historical inclusion of black people within the biblical narrative that is you know, often overlooked uh, 
in the historical, I mean, in the artistic representations, you would see uh, usually, you know, white cherubs and a white Jesus and a white crowd, and you know, you just weren't part of that story. Maybe there was a, you know, a black person, you know, with the three kings or somebody in the background carrying something. And most of these stories and traditions and narratives and folklore kind of originated out of the Middle East and out of Africa and out of these places, you know, where Jerusalem is located. And people of color were there. They were part of this whole community. They were part of this historical, uh, but the representation of that, that diverse group that wasn't there. So um, the church wanted a piece that would, uh, would be inclusive of that and, and, you know, to be able to add to that story. Um, and they could see the need because you have a contemporary community who feels as if they don't belong because they don't see that they belong. They don't see themselves being part of the structure and the monuments and the memorials that exist to talk about the historical significance of who they are. So the piece Ascension, I created, and the composition of the piece actually has the Christ figure with his back facing the viewer. It's a iconic kind of uh, imagery created by artists like uh, Raphael and um, Michelangelo, where you would have Christ ascending after the crucifixion, but he would always be facing the viewer, the Christ figure. And in this painting, the Christ figure, first he's, a, he's black and his back is facing you because I wanted the people on the bottom, the diverse group of people on the bottom, kind of representing this untold group, all looking up at the Christ figure as he's rising and seeing a reflection of themselves being, you know, um, as a reflection of God. So that was the ascension piece. And I think that kind of imagery has a profound effect on people looking at it because it creates a idea that the reflection of God can be anybody. Most societies, when they create uh, images of their deities, whether it's the Buddha, who's Asian, or whether it's uh, you know, the Aztecs with Casa Cuadro, or whether it's, um, whether it's in Africa, whether it's um, you know, Odin in the Scandinavian, they're always, the image of God is always a reflection of that culture because it gives us something to aspire to. It gives us a reflection of ourselves, a higher self to, almost as if you could create a perfect monument of who you would want to be and you see it every day and you emulate that monument and you become that monument. But if that monument is, is so foreign as to who you are and you could never reach that ideal, then you could never create, you can never become that perfection. So I think those things are important uh, for all people. And society has proven through the ages that it's an important part of, of, uh, of cultures to have those reflections of self within art. The ascension has certainly allowed people in, at Fourth Church to think about art differently mm -hmm. and to think about um, images within the church differently. Mm -hmm. so, so think about the word you just said, images. Images comes from imagine or imagination. And your imagination creates your reality. So if you imagine that uh, something is wrong with your legs and you can't walk, and you believe in that, even if you're physically able to walk, you won't be able to walk because the image that you have is limited. So if images help us to define and believe and create the reality, then in the importance of those images takes on a whole different perspective. You know, how important is it? You know how important it is? Functionally, the only thing you would need on currency is numbers. This is a dollar, this is a hundred, this is 500, on and on. But an image on the a, on a dollar creates an idea that not only is that dollar of value, but that image is of value. So when you pick up a dollar bill, people covet it, they fight for it, they kill for it. This image is, 
is, you know, George Washington, of these regal gentlemen, is presented. And if I'm a little white kid, I'm thinking, this could be my grandfather. This could be my uncle. Hey, he kind of looks like my uncle. If I'm a black kid, you know, this is always somebody else. I can never be that. I'm not, I'm not a value. There's a psychological aspect. There's a physiological, there's a spiritual aspect that images have upon our psyche. And if all of the images you see are one-sided, then your perspective is one-sided. So how do you change that paradigm? You know, how do we become more inclusive of these stories and narratives and memorials and monuments to where they tell the story of a human family as opposed to just one member of the human family? Oh, that's such a good point. What a wonderful analogy, the way you brought all of that together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So, Gerald, now I'd like to transition uh, and talk a little bit about, we've heard a lot about you as an artist. Mm -hmm. uh, some of us have seen your art at Fourth Presbyterian, uh, but many people may not know about the business side of your, your person. Mm -hmm. uh, you are not only a business person, successful business person, I might add, You've also founded a nonprofit organization. Mm -hmm. I'd like to hear about that. But let's begin with the business side. Okay. You recently moved your business from the downtown area to Chatham, a neighborhood on the south side of Chicago. Tell us about this incredible place that you've created. You have a studio. Mm -hmm. Your wife has a showroom space here. Mm -hmm. And you also have an event space that once people are able to gather again, is, a, is available to rent for functions. That's, that's huge, all of it. Any, yeah. any one thing in and of itself would be a lot. <laughs> so yeah, you said huge. This place is 46,000 square feet, so it is huge. My gallery, my art gallery, used to be in the River North for a number of years. And um, my wife, who's originally from Haiti, but she lived in Florida, built her design business, interior design business, and she had a 7,000 square foot uh, showroom in Florida. And I convinced her, you know, when we got married, to leave uh, Florida for sunny Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and we kind of combined our businesses. So Griffin Gallery became Griffin Gallery and Interiors. And at the time when she was making a transition, she was also working, because she's an interior designer, she's an architectural designer, she's a general contractor now as well. She was working on a, a series of, um, of products, doing product design, furniture, appliances, and on and on that she wanted to, that she had been working on to launch. And, um, we were looking for a large building. One, to have the gallery space. Two, that could be a big enough space to showcase her new line and her interior design showrooms. And we wanted to have a space that would also be an event space, an upscale, beautiful <coughs> event space that uh, could be in a black community. We didn't know exactly where, which community, and, but we wanted it to be in a community where um, you know, black people could go and feel comfortable having a nice place to gather within their own community. They didn't have to go downtown or the hotel. They didn't have to go way out to the south suburbs. They could just be right in the midst of their own neighborhood. Um, seeing things like that helps to encourage other businesses to uh, grow like that. Um, I know growing up as a, as a kid, I would have been delighted to be able to walk into a gallery like my gallery right now it's like a, a museum and, and feel like you were at a museum downtown but you're in your own neighborhood and you're walking into a gallery that's owned and a building that's owned by a black couple so the name of this building is the Bordeaux Griffin Design Center and we imagine creating a place that would be like a mini merchandise mark that would showcase um, her different design studios showcase the art gallery uh, be a place where people could gather and have events and also be a place where we could nurture uh, the talent 
within the community. And that's how uh, Artist Life NFP, which stands for not-for-profit, was born. So tell us about the NFP, the not-for-profit that you formed. Uh, okay. Why did you feel it was important to make that kind of a commitment? Mm -hmm. And what is currently in, in process and what do you see as your mission for the future with the organization? Okay. So Artist Life NFP, the name actually really describes what it's about. It's about the life of an artist. And, um, you know, when I, I mentioned it earlier in a view that uh, when I was just graduating from Art Institute, I worked at a frame shop uh, part time to kind of support me before things took off, uh, my art took off. And in that frame shop, shop, I learned about framing. I learned about custom framing. I learned about um, conservation of art. Um, I learned about the frame business. So when I opened my first gallery, it wasn't in the River North, it was way south, it was in Evergreen Plaza. And 80% of the business was custom framing because I learned how to do custom framing. So I offered custom framing and maybe 20% was art. But as that grew and 80% of it was art sales and 20% was custom framing, then I moved downtown to the River North. But there's so many artists, professional artists who I know now, who they don't have a clue about framing. They create a piece of art, but they have to go and take it to somebody because they don't know about framing. They don't know about pricing their art. They don't know about, you know, how do I, present, how do I get in this um, art fair? How do I present my portfolio? How do I, they don't know the business side of art. You go to art school and you learn the techniques but the business side of how do you survive after you walk out of the door, not being a star starving artist, what are the protocols? A lot of that isn't known. You have a lot of young kids who are talented. Oh, I'm really talented. People say, oh, my son is talented. My daughter is talented. I hope, I, I'd like them to one day be an artist. But how do you go from knowing that you have this uh, talent to that becoming, becoming a professional artist or understanding that that intangible is valuable? And that's what artist life is about. So my idea was to teach kind of this whole entrepreneurial uh, idea to different artists, from kids all the way up to seasoned artists. Uh, a typical artist life um, session would be six to 12 weeks of classes. And then within those classes, we would go through techniques, we would go through uh, conservation, how to do framing, we would go through preservation, how to put on an exhibition, we would go through um, just a whole A to B of being an artist and creating this commodity, pricing this commodity. At the end of the 12 weeks, we'd have a black tie exhibition in the gallery and the works would be for sale and each of those artists would receive a commission. So now you've just had the artist's life literally lived and then you leave the class and you know how to do an art exhibition. Uh, we learn about you know, presenting your portfolio, writing an artist statement, those different things. And it's the same way from the design side, where if you're interested in being a designer, well, how do you go from being interested in being a designer to designing a product, which is what my wife does, or being interested in the design and how this building is built? What is architecture? What is drafting? So it's really um, exposing or trying to expose these entrepreneurial um, principles of an artist and, uh, and it's a not-for-profit and it's, it's something that we're trying to do with the community. That is so marvelous. I, I commend you and your wife for taking on that kind of commitment <laughs> to the community yeah. on top of everything else that you both do. So yeah. how would people learn more about the nonprofit or, or mm -hmm. make a donation if they were interested? You could go to www.artislifenfp.org. And of course, the website will open up and they'll have a page for donations. They have a page for virtual art class because our art class had to be virtual right now because of you know, COVID and the pandemic. So we've been having kind of a, a staggered uh, art class online. Once the pandemic is gone, we're gonna actually have the in-house uh, art classes and courses and kind of do that whole uh, process that I just talked about. And also, you know, we're always looking for volunteers. We're always looking for 
people who are inspired to, you know, help the community and, and nurture those young people who have aspirations for being an artist or who are talented but don't know where to go with it. Um, you know, it's just a way of, um, of keeping that legacy going. Um, one thing about the art that I create, um, I try to use materials that I know are time tested. So I only paint in oils, I don't paint in acrylics. Acrylics is pretty, is a, is a new form of art. Uh, it's only been around maybe 80, 90 years. Well, you can get, you know, oil paintings from you know, the 15th century. So I know they're gonna outlast me in my mm -hmm. lifetime and maybe even it's my It's part kids. of the legacy. Or bronzes that'll be here for yeah, that legacy, that memorial. Um, it's the idea of, uh, of building a legacy, of building a tradition. Those traditional things that we had as a culture of African Americans that were lost in time. Uh, there are great monuments that exist in Egypt and in uh, Ethiopia that are glimpses of the past that we're disconnected with because that language was lost, those connections were severed. But that doesn't mean that you can't begin to create new legacies. And that's what we're trying to do with the design. And you're doing a very excellent job of creating that legacy, if thank I you. might say. Thank and you. I want to thank you so much for sharing your time and your talent you. with us to present the two sessions for the adult education program. Uh, mm -hmm. We appreciate you for that. And I'm hoping people will seek you out to hear more about your art, learn more yes. about your nonprofit. Yes. and. Mm -hmm. Uh, your art is for sale? Is yes. That, that I, the greatest compliment you can pay to an artist is to say, I want this piece to be a part of my okay. life. Okay, and if I wanted this own. piece of art to be part of my life, I understand you have created a marketing campaign to yes. make that possible. Tell us about that before we close. So, um, you know, people will come into the gallery and say, oh, I love this piece, you know. It's, it's $4,000, and oh, I can't do $4,000. You know, I don't have $4,000, but I love this piece and I want it. So I partnered with this company called Art Money, artmoney.com, it's easy to find. And with Art Money, you could go on Art Money and you can then you know, pull up Griffin Gallery, Gerald Griffin Gallery, select a piece, and it's interest free for 10 months and pay one tenth, one you know, tenth of it down and take it home. And you have almost a year to pay for it, it's interest free, it's hanging in your house, and it spreads that out in a way that makes sense. It goes from you know, $1,000 to $100,000. So there's no limit in terms of what you can buy with art money, and it's a way for people to kind of purchase the art that they love. A good example, quick, quick example, I know we're running out of time, but um, the painting, that the uh, church commission is, is valued at about $35,000. When I uh, graduated from Art Institute, I wasn't selling paintings that size and that medium for $35,000, um, which was dating myself 30 years ago. But for a collector who bought a piece of mine, an oil, that size for $6,000. Today they would be selling it for $35,000. Mm -hmm. So that piece has appreciated mm -hmm. in their house while they're enjoying it. It's appreciated in value, you know, it's appreciated in its significance, and it's an investment. So when people understand it from that perspective, uh, you first begin your art money journey by the time you end your art money journey, your piece may be more valuable than what you paid for it at the beginning. So it's a, it's a good way to start investing. Excellent point. Thank you. And as I said, Gerald Griffin is an amazing artist, sculptor, poet, laureate, and entrepreneur. Thank you. Thank you. I hope everyone enjoyed uh, that, the second interview with Gerald Griffin. Can you hear me okay?
Yeah. All yeah. right. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the goals for this class was to provoke your thoughts and encourage conversations. So we're at the point of the program where we will take your, your questions if you put them in the chat. And today, Lucy's going to assist me with, uh, with a chat question. So while you're giving some thought to what you might like to add to the chat, um, I want to share one of the comments that was made uh, by Jean Anderson. Uh, Gerald, I think you'll like hearing this. We've heard the word speaking to and about racial justice, but the visual in images magnify the impact in beautiful, powerful, and lasting media. Thank you, this program is amazing. So Jean, thank you for that comment. Uh, uh, there's another question. Have you published any of your poetry? Um, no, I have not. The, uh, the idea with uh, the Paradigm Shift series, um, after I created the, most of the work in the Paradigm Shift series, um, I was uh, presented with a solo exhibition at a museum in Lafayette, Indiana, Art Museum of Greater Lafayette. And it was a solo show which featured uh, seven of the sculptures and all of the paintings. And, um, you know, as I mentioned early, each of, the, each of those pieces were based on poems that I read. And the poetry was, um, was printed and posted next to each piece. So that was the first time that this, the poems, uh, my poems had been, um, had been shown publicly or have been published where people would come and see and read and, and see that aspect of my creativity. And each painting or sculpture was a visual interpretation of that poem. Um, there is a, uh, a catalog, a museum catalog uh, that came along with the show and it has um, a um, representation of the works that were there along with the poems uh, next to the piece. So that's really the only, only where that the uh, work is, that the poems, the literary work is published at this point. I'm thinking about, uh, you know, doing a book and, and creating something that is a collectible for people um, to uh, share that, that aspect or that side of, of uh, the work that I create. So long story short, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> not yet but it's possible in the future. Yes. Uh, in today's conversation, you talked about um, presenting a proposal for the Monumental Series. Yes. What's involved in that? And where, where are you in the process of getting you funding to, to launch? Interesting question. Um, I kind of developed this idea for the Monumental Series in June of 2019, when, you know, I mean, it was like looking at the, uh, the, uh, the racial unrest and, the, you know, the uh, desire to destroy, destroy these monuments. And then that night thinking about, you know, how, what would be a, a creative social response? How could we address that? And then I, I worked on this proposal and this is, was, this was a nationwide phenomenon, this, this, uh, you know, this, this upheaval. So my proposal was for a nationwide campaign of creating um, historical monuments that, in, that expanded the narrative of historical canon. And um, so I envisioned doing, you know, I envision artists doing, I won't just say my, myself, but I envision artists doing, you know, 500 monuments, new, new monuments all around the country. Uh, some, in close proximity to monuments that people were um, feeling offended by, that would also have a different perspective and a different historical uh, reference in that same public space to kind of balance out that story and, um, and tell both sides of the story, which takes the power away from, well, this is a romanticized fictional history and it's one-sided and it leads out my, my, uh, my significance. So that was the idea. I sent a proposal to the uh, 
to the mayor's office for 10 monuments in Chicago. I sent it to uh, the state senators, state senator L.D. Sims, and in the proposal it had, this is what, uh, this is the a number of pieces. These, this is an example of the size, lifetime or two times life size. Uh, it would include, uh, the creation of the piece would include utilizing students from artist life or local artists to create these pieces. So it would be, you know, economically, it would create jobs at a time when everything was closed and there was no jobs. And, you know, uh, there was that uh, cabin fever. And it would, uh, it would be inclusive. It would, it would uh, you know, it would, it would be in the public space. And the artists creating these pieces would be a diverse group of artists. It wouldn't just be black artists. It would just be artists, but it would be artists working on stories that are ra rarely told perspectives that are rarely put out there. It would be a way to um, change the paradigm or change our paradigm about uh, you know, being at odds to, with each other as opposed to coming together with each other. And I sent it to the mayor's office. Uh, I, I have a friend who worked with the mayor and he got an email back, he shared it with me. The mayor said, this is interesting, blah, blah, blah. I'll get back to you. I never heard anything and maybe month ago, two months ago, I got an email that the city put together a commission that was called Chicago Monuments. And they were sending out uh, information to different uh, individuals and organizations about creating monuments and you know, taking down some of them. I was like, that, that's my idea. Anyway, <laughs> um, when I came up with this idea, I knew that it might be hard for people to imagine what I was talking about. And so I started creating these maquettes, these small samples uh, of what could possibly one day be large monumental sculptures. Um, currently, I have two proposals that I sent to the city. One for the Chatham neighborhood, because there's a uh, individual here, you guys probably have heard of her before, Mahalia Jackson. She was a gospel singer. Um, she was a civil rights uh, icon. She's the one who told Martin Luther King, tell him about your dream, Martin. And then the great, I have a dream speech was made. Uh, and she grew up in Chatham. So she's one of the uh, iconic figures who um, I'm proposing doing a large monumental sculpture of because her story, the significance of who she was in this, this neighborhood is it isn't in the public square. Nobody, few people know about that. Um, Douglas Park, uh, the Park District is thinking of renaming Douglas Park for Anna and Frederick Douglas. So I have a proposal with them that I've sent out to try to do a large sculpture of Frederick Douglas and Anna Douglas. Um, Dr. Daniel Hill Williams, Providence Hospital, first black, uh, well, let's just say the first open heart surgery ever created was done by this black doctor. There's so many African-Americans who've never even heard of him. He should have a monument out in front of that hospital because it will bring into people's awareness who this person was, what the history is, how he fits into Chicago and the narrative of America. That is a, his practice is standard practice now in the medical field, but how many people know that it was this black doctor who came up with that? So, I mean, there's so much there's so many stories, there's so much history that um, would help to change our, our ideas and perspectives about who we are that could be done and could address um, a lot of the division that we have. Um, most black people you talk to can tell you that and some people will ask, well, why do you, you know, why is the focus of your work always around these issues of equity and racial, um, you know, racial tension and things like that? Um, when there's so many other things that you could do as an artist, you could do landscapes or paintings or happy things or what have you. Not that some of these aren't happy, but as Black people, we live with the idea of racism 24 hours, 365 days of year. An example, a good example was, so I woke up this morning, I came to the showroom to do this Zoom. And afterwards, I'm going to go to the gym. So I didn't put on a 
you know, suit or tie to put on a dress shirt. I put on my sweats, my hoodie. But in grabbing my hoodie, I'm always thinking about what I'm gonna wear, how I'm gonna, what if I get pulled over by the police? You know, I might die on the way home. I might die on the way to the, to the studio. That's a reality that I have to live with being black in America, or being black in the world, but being black in America. That's a real reality that a lot of people don't even have to think. You know, just grab your sweats, you go, you do whatever. But you always have to have this idea of blackness first because there's this, there's this um, tendency of society, society that separates and creates this other. And I think that's a paradigm that needs to change. So I'm trying it's to- kind of those comments are a great segue to a question that Lucy put in the chat. Mm -hmm. And the question is, is the function of art to reflect or reveal the culture or do you lead slash influence it or both? Well, the function, art has a lot of functions. Um, I don't think there's just one function of art. Um, I think it has a documentary function where it talks about uh, moments in time. It gives it, it reflects what's going on in the world at this time period. So 300 years from now, somebody could be looking at these pieces and looking at um, the expressions of artists and they could say, well, this was the world that this artist was living in. This was his interpretation. This was his, um, re his response or his expression based on the world and society that he was living at at that time. You can look at Francisco Goya and his paintings about the revolution. You can look at um, just on and on with different, with different artworks. And it would tell you a lot about what was going on in the world. So it, it has a documentary aspect to it. It has a, um, it has a cultural veneration aspect to it in that um, when you're an artist of whatever culture, the work that you reflect is going to reflect your experiences and your culture and your background. So if I'm an Asian artist, there'll be some references to Asian culture within my art. Even if it, even if it isn't Asian subject matter, you kind of bring yourself into the world. So that aspect is there. And then people of a like culture, and they, they can relate to that. You know, everyone can relate to it, but they can really relate to it because they have some shared experiences culturally and traditionally. So it has that aspect to it. It has a uh, it has a psychological and spiritual aspect to it, in that um, it makes us not only look at the art, but it makes us look at ourselves. Uh, if it's if it's a strong piece of art, in my opinion, um, it makes us look at ourselves. And uh, depending upon what that art is, and and actually the historical monument. Uh, I should say the uh, destruction of historical monuments is a prime example. So people see a sculpture of uh, King Leopold and they feel enraged because this Belgian king murdered 10 million people, chopped off their hands, you know, uh, in, in Africa uh, during colonization because of, you know, they're, they're taking the natural resources of rubber and forced labor and they kill people like cattle. And, but there's huge monuments, you know, of this sky, huge palaces. So if you're a descendant of those people, you're a descendant of African people, or if you're anyone in the world that has a conscience, you feel almost, in, you know, you feel pained by that monument. You want to take it down. You want to erase that history. That's what people felt uh, when they see, um, some of the Columbus. Now, Columbus was Italian. He was an explorer. He was a um, um, he was a seaman, and they came to South America. They they uh, basically founded America, quote unquote. And there are people who are already here in America. There's uh, there were cultures who were wiped out. There were people who were brought to this country as slaves to work in these lands. So they have a different perspective on who Columbus was. And that narrative and that story isn't told 
often there's this, this romanticized vision of Columbus. Um, there's lots of stories about our history and our um, icons and our heroes that are skewed and one-sided. And when we learn a fuller story, it changes our perspective, not only historically, but even contemporary. Think about Bill Cosby. I grew up loving Bill Cosby. Oh, Bill Cosby, you know, Fat Albert and the Cosby Kids, on and on and on. But then you learn there's a whole nother aspect to the personality of who this person is. And it changes your paradigm. It changes your perspective mm -hmm. about Bill Cosby. It humanizes him, but it changes this idealization of who a person is. And I think we have that idealization of historical figures, which helps us to be uh, prejudiced against each other. Right. Oh, well, That's you know, George Washington never told a lie, or Thomas Jefferson was a great president. Well, you know, Thomas Jefferson financed his house off of his slaves. He took a loan out from the bank, you know, based on his his property, and uh, he had a wife and kids, and then he had a mistress and kids by a slave woman, um, Sally Hemings, and they remained in slavery. So he had this juxtaposition of brothers, half brothers, both living in the same uh, home, but one is a slave and one is free. So Look, we're almost some... out of time, and I wanna make sure, I'm yeah. sorry to interrupt that, but we've got- yeah, No, 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 just thing about, a few minutes. <laughs> thing about the, the art is there's a lot into it when I'm creating these pieces. And I actually don't talk to a lot of people. I'm going to see my studio is empty. So now <laughs> I'm just kind of going on and on. So I'm sorry. Well, there's a good, um, we have time for two more questions. And then Lucy wanted to make some closing remarks today. But what you were just talking about is a, is a great lead in to one of the questions from, let's see, uh, Ira. Gerald, thank you very much. Uh, do you ever produce works that are emotionally difficult for you to sell? Uh, yes, <laughs> yes, I have. Uh, I've done that a lot. And I'll give you a, a, a quick example. And I actually sold this work, it's a quick story. So I did a painting called, um, geez, what's the name of the painting? <laughs> Okay, so the painting was of this, this, this guy. He's in a business suit, he's got a, a hat on. And in the front of him is this little kid. And, uh, and he's screaming, it's almost, it's, you know, it, it, it references to uh, uh, every, the monk uh, painting the scream, everybody's seen it where it's like this, you know, the eyes and the mouth. And it's a very famous iconic painting. So this kid in the front has this impression, this expression on his face. And the guy has his hand inside his coat and he's dressed and the buildings are askew in the background. And um, the, uh, it's a black guy, business guy, but his eyes are blue. And he kind of symbolized um, figures within, for me, he, he symbolized figures within the black community who gained prominence and success and, um, and they want to escape the fact that they're black or tied to the black community. So it's almost as if, you know, it, it, they just go into a transformation and their eyes turn blue and they don't recognize that they're black and they don't recognize other black people. And they say, hey, well, you know, um, how come this rest of the black community isn't successful like me? And this kid in the front is, uh, in my opinion, he's screaming at the fact that you would uh, lose yourself. Uh, lose yourself, lose, lose your culture, lose a, a contact with yourself. Um, my God, I'm going to have to <laughs> show this to you guys or send a, a, a clip on, online. Okay. Um, it's part of a series in, long ago, but it was very difficult to sell. The woman who bought it was crying and she oh, asked too. I don't want that in my house. And then they came back a month later and bought it. So, so there you have it. <laughs> um, our last question before I turn it over to Lucy for closing. It, the last question is from Gary and Susan Graham and they are saying they were enthralled by the painting behind you during the interview. Can you talk about it? It was a face floating in white. So it's the image on uh, the first floor. Yeah, so the, the title of that piece is Drowning in a Sea of White. And it's a little black kid. And actually in the painting, if you could see, Although everything is painted white, there's a city skyline. There's a, and it's almost as if someone is in water and they're coming up to take a breath of fresh air. And 
then they're going to go back down. You know, it's almost like everything is covered in white. And it's this idea that as a black person, everything that you do in society is compared to your white counterpart. So I mentioned that earlier when I was talking about people saying African Americans as opposed to just Americans. You don't, or Africans or Blacks, you don't say Italian American. You just say Italian. You don't say, you know, you know, this guy's Irish American. So no, he's Irish. Um, you don't say, oh, he's a great doctor. Uh, you say he's a great black doctor. He's a great black writer. He's a great black. You always have this prefix. So just like I talked about wearing this hoodie before I go outside and me having to think about blackness before I walk out the door. It's that idea of drowning in the sea of white, drowning in the sea of uh, invisible racism that exists within society, that you open your door and you're in a new paradigm. When you're in your house and you're in your family, you don't even think about the fact that you're black, you're just people. As soon as you walk out the door, you're a person, but you're black. So that's what that painting really deals with, this idea. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we're gonna have to stop there, but I, I wanna thank you again. Uh, this was a wonderful uh, opportunity to learn more, to hear about your experience, experiences as an artist and giving us the opportunity to think about how we can apply what we've learned in the last two weeks. I hope there will be another opportunity for us to work together with you and continue to pursue this conversation, this narrative, and in a way that will um, help our community, our church, our city, and, and, and our nation. And I wanna underscore something that you mentioned early in the first session, and that is we are all part of the human family. So we're going to need to figure out, you know, how we can all walk through the door, come to the table, sit down and appreciate the fact that we are part of the human family and we do have a seat at the table. Um, oh, somebody suggested we should have a field trip to your gallery when we can. And I am all for that, right? Yeah, yes, yes. Great. You see it's empty here. So come on. I need some help. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So Lucy, Gerald, thank you so much. I'm so thank you guys for having me. This was this yeah. was good. And Elsie, I'm gonna turn it over to you for closing. Thank you, Cynthia. I just want to thank you, Gerald, so much, not only for your witness to us through this last two weeks, but also for your witness every time we walk into the commons at Fourth Church and that absolutely magnificent work of art, it's just people just stop. It's a, a complete stopper in terms of their energy and their life and I imagine their spirit. But what I wanted to close with, I wanna also thank you so much and thank Cynthia for all of your leadership with this and your inspiration. And also uh, Victoria Rock, who was our videographer who came on site and did the video and, and uh, beautiful, beautiful work on that, as well as Jim uh, Garner, who is our, uh, support staff today and Michael Mirza, but I, I just want to let you know that it takes a village to do this work and the village has been uh, seen today. The other thing I want to say is that we all are in a place in our lives where the paradigm is shifting and also I really believe that the way in order to have our own lives transformed and shaped and changed is through these kind of engagements to be able to see through the, your eyes, the world and be able to hold the images that do indeed um, basically create our own identity and our inner world. And so you have provided a way for us to shift the paradigm during these last two weeks and we will continue to hold the way open that our own lives will not only be just changed, but be transformed not only by your work, but also by our, um, by God. So let's close in prayer. Gracious and merciful God, you are the great God, a God who has informed and loved and created us in your image. So God, help us to know you more fully through the articulation and energy and engagement of people like Gerald Griffin, whose artistic talent helps us to see the world in new ways. 
and grant that as we step boldly forward into this world in these days in which we're living that you would give us courage and strength to see things that we might not want to see but to hold them in our hearts and our minds and our spirits knowing that you are a god who has given us a courageous heart and loving spirit we ask this in the name of jesus amen nice Thank you again, everyone. I feel like I shouldn't be closing this. I feel like Cynthia, you should be. So um, well, I will close in. Uh, there was an amazing amount of feedback in the chat, just thanking Gerald. And I want to thank everyone who has let us know how much you enjoyed uh, being part of this conversation last Sunday and this Sunday. So uh, continued blessings and we look forward to the next time, the next class and the next opportunity to be with you again. Bye.